Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Passive Income MBA Investing in Real Estate Syndications. Today, I'm so excited to have Amy Wan on the show. Seriously, Amy is just a wealth of knowledge, and um, she's extremely easy to communicate with. Like She breaks things down in a really clear way. So Amy, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you for being on. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So everyone, Amy Wan is founder and CEO of Bootstrap Legal, which automates real estate syndication legal documents and a partner at Sosnow and Associated, a securities law firm. She hosts the Law and Blockchain podcast and has authored the Bloomberg Law Practice Guide to ICOs and LexisNexis's Private Equity Practice Guide. And I know you've got a lot more in your background, Amy. I'm going to pause right there and give you a chance to just take us back in time. Tell us how you got started in this industry and just give us an overview of how you got to where you are now. Wow. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> never actually started off to, to do securities or real estate syndication law, but um, I started off my career in the federal government. Um, you know, so out in DC, working for Department of Transportation, State Department, Department of Commerce, doing international trade policy. Um, it was actually because I met my husband out in DC, who was doing um, finishing up med school at the time. He matched for residency out here in LA, and so that was the end of my international trade career because I had to move to, you know, back out to the West Coast, and so. Um, I ended up becoming general counsel at a uh, early stage real estate crowdfunding platform. So that's really where I got my feet wet in securities law, real estate. That platform happened to deal primarily with debt, uh, mostly you know private money, hard money stuff. Um, but over the years, I then went on to uh, become partner at a boutique real estate syndication firm where I learned the equity side of things, hence real estate syndication. And, uh, you know, after a while, I actually left and started Bootstrap Legal because, um, you know, I, I made a friend, a, a client who was an aspiring real estate syndicator. And he came to me, he's like, okay, I want to do my first raise. I'm going to raise $300,000. And I was like, okay, well, you can do that. But when I tell you the price tag of the legal paperwork, I will not fault you for not doing it. Um, and so I told him the price and of course he didn't do it. He, he, you know, went out and did something in a different way. And, uh, you know, it just made me realize that the transactional cost of real estate syndications for a lot of folks, especially folks raising smaller amounts of money don't really work. And then, you know, at the same time, I, you know, clients always call Friday at four 30, um, asking for something. And so you end up working the weekend and, Truthfully, there was a lot in the legal documents that I thought could be automated. And so um, I started Bootstrap Legal, um, A, to save myself time, right? So, and then clients, uh, you know, we're actually now the, the fastest law firm in the industry. Um, we, we turn around uh, documents generally in three, three business days, which is, you know, um, astronomically fast. Um, and it's because we pair technology alongside um, actual attorneys. So, you know, the, the first draft is uh, automated by machine, but, you know, the attorney still reviews it, writes in all the bespoke aspects. And then um, after that, everything's, everything's still um, cleared by an attorney. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a wild ride these past couple of years. <laughs> That is uh, super awesome to hear what you've been working on for the last several years and um, very interesting product. I definitely need to check it out. Um, so Amy, you're an expert in, you know, in my eyes in securities law, give us an idea about what listeners should be keeping in mind as far as the regulatory requirements around real estate syndication. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to start off with the very basic general, right? So um, generally, if you are selling a security in the United States, you have to register offering. Um, when I say registering offering, that's an offering that's, you know, basically people think of it as going public, you know, IPOing, um, doing the whole shebang, which is very expensive. It's a very time consuming process. 
Um, but interestingly, more money is actually raised in the US via unregistered offerings. And so when you do not register an offering, you have to be operating under exemption. And the one that is most common um, amongst uh, private placements or real estate syndication is what I call rule 506B as in boy under regulation D as in dog, right? That one basically says you can raise as much as you want. Um, you can have as many accredited investors as you want. Those accredited investors can self-certify, but you can only have up to 35 non-accredited investors and you cannot be generally advertising, what the SEC calls general solicitation, right? So that means no posting flyers at your local community bulletin, um, no, you know, widespread digital advertising. You really need to be communicating about the offering with your friends and families, and you have to have a pre-existing relationship and they need to be sophisticated, which means they need to have some sort of idea about what they're investing in. Um, another exemption that's gotten more popular over the past couple years, it's, it's a lot newer, is what I call 506C as in cat. And so to the extent you log on to Facebook nowadays or, you know, any other social media platform and you say, you see like, hey, um, invest in our offering, we're offering this, they're probably offering it under rule 506C, which does allow for um, general solicitation or advertising, but you're limited to accredited investors only. And uh, you, you know, the sponsor has to take reasonable steps to verify that they're actually accredited. So what that means is you as an investor are going to be asked at some point to either provide a letter from an attorney, your CPA, your registered investment advisor, or something like that, that shows that you are basically a rich person. Um, there's services now that provide it. Our law firm does it as well. Um, but you, know, you should be expecting to pull uh, credit histories, um, you, you know, pay stubs, uh, you know, tax, tax uh, filings, things of that sort, depending on, on um, your method of accreditation. So that's like the, the very high level. Um, I think in terms of practicalities for, uh, you know, your, your passive investor, you know, certainly whenever they're investing in a real estate syndication deal, they should want the syndicator to be following all the laws because, you know, A, if the syndicator is not, the syndicator is actually at risk of, um, you know, a lot of pain and headaches from the SEC or state regulators. And you really want them to be concentrating, right, on making money through your deal, not hiring, uh, you know, defense counsel, um, because they're they're not sleeping at night because they're dealing with the SEC every day. But secondly, you know, to the extent that they um, are not following securities laws, it's not uncommon in the industry for sponsors to get sued by their own investors. And and you know, when sponsors get sued, guess who's paying for it? It's the investors, right? There are usually indemnification clauses in all these deals, and so. If one of your fellow investors is suing the sponsor um, for not following securities laws, um, usually because they've lost money or they have a personal argument with the sponsor, uh, it will be coming out of, out of your pocketbook. Um, so in terms of what they should be expecting to see whenever they're investing in a deal, certainly there should be some sort of offering circular or private placement, something that discloses all the risks of the deal and details exactly what they're getting. Um, in recent years, people have, uh, some people now are making this less of a legal document, more into like a marketing showcase piece. So there's all these like pretty pictures in the PPM, but you do want to make sure that, you know, all the disclosures and risk factors and everything are there. Um, you know, oftentimes there will be some sort of governance document. So usually it'll be some sort of LLC or GPLP structure, in which case there will be um, an operating agreement. Um, sometimes it might be a corporation. So there should be bylaws, right? Um, you want to make sure this is actually a real legit entity. 
Um, and you will also be signing uh, what is usually called a subscription agreement. It might be called investment agreement, um, but you know, it's, it's basically the agreement that you are signing as an investor to say, yes, I am investing this deal. This is how much I'm giving. And these are the units or the shares that I'm getting. Um, yeah. So that's the basic overview in, in terms of like what documents you should be seeing. Uh, did you want me to go into? Yeah, let's, um, why don't you yeah. go into what a investor should maybe focus on when they're reviewing these documents? Right. Um, so certainly the, the first thing every investor looks at, I'm sure, is the distribution structure or the waterfall structure, right? And um, what I think is really important here is making sure that you understand exactly what you are getting. Um, you know, I, I have a number of friends who are now getting into real estate syndication and they haven't really studied enough, I think, um, on uh, knowing how to really do diligence to every deal. So in terms of the legal paperwork, when you're looking at the distribution of waterfall structure, you should know, um, you know, for example, is there a preferred return? If there's a pre preferred return, what is it based off of? And what does the waterfall actually look like, right? Because there's, there's different types of waterfall structures. If you have a preferred return, sometimes you get um, some sort of pref and then it goes straight into the, uh, the investor sponsor split, right? So very standard for your average um, value add multifamily is gonna be maybe like eight to 9% preferred return. And then um, maybe like a 70-30 split, 70 to investors, 30 to um, sponsors with maybe a 10% deviation. Um, sometimes people will do a preferred return with a catch up, which means the investor gets the preferred return and then the sponsor group um, catches up on that equivalent amount. And then it goes into um, you know, the, the regular split. Some people have multiple waterfalls and so multiple split, splits. Some people, um, some sponsors will, you know, throw in that the preferred return is inclusive, uh, that, that the split is inclusive of the preferred return, um, which, you know, affects your distributions in a different way. Um, some people just have a very easy standard split, although the, I think that's getting more rare nowadays. Um, now you're starting to see people do interesting things like, you know, they are splitting the capital stack into multiple classes. So they have, you know, the more traditional preferred return with a split. And then they have um, a category for investors who are, are literally more so clipping a coupon. Um, and when the deal refinances in a couple of years, they will get paid out, but then they're out of the deal. So they get, don't get upside, right? But they, you know, they're, they're, it almost acts like debt, but it's not really debt. Um, and then, you know, the, the regular investors um, get their preferred return after that um, and the upside because they stay in the deal until the deal actually exits or sells. Refinance is not considered an exit. But, you know, there's also um, sponsors who, uh, don't use that coupon structure and they will um, tell investors, hey, you get a preferred return. But when we are refinancing, that's considered an exit. And at that point, we're buying you out. So even if we don't sell the asset, um, you know, like you are no longer a part of the, the, um, the LLC um, and you will no longer be receiving cash flows and distribution. So these are, I think, the finer things that you should be looking for. Um, Real quick, just on, I want to just touch on that particular point. So what would the language look like if, the, if they were going to, the sponsor was going to, um, at a refinance, pay back investors, and then they're out of the deal? Like, what is, what do you look for to see if that's what they're trying to do? Right. So, you know, obviously different law firms draft this in different ways. I can tell you, at least in um, the documents that I use, um, you know, we will break out uh, the distribution from when you're in operations, from when you're in, you're doing what we call a capital transaction, right? And a capital transaction, 
<coughs> can be defined different ways. It can be defined as sale um, or refinance, um, or it can be, you know, uh, you, you can basically take refinance in and out of that definition. You also want to be looking at, you know, what they actually say at the distributions upon a capital transaction. And, and you know, even for folks who aren't so, um, so experienced at looking at this, you know, always be sure to ask the sponsor, right? Um, or or your, your attorney. Granted, the sponsor is not your attorney and you're supposed to use your own, own attorney to interpret your legal documents, but, um, you know, the, the sponsor should, should know as well, right? They should be able to give you an answer up front. Okay, yeah. Um, I just thought I'd ask that particular question. So what, aside from the waterfall, or were you done talking about waterfall? Yeah, so there's waterfalls. I would say there's also fees, right? There should be um, a part in the PPM and the operating agreement that talks about fees and you should know what fees you're being charged and what the fees are a percentage of. Um, it used to be much more standard back in the day. And now, um, you know, I would say that people are like, naming different fees, different things, and they're, it's being based off of percentages of different things. So, so, you know, know the numbers. Um, and then, you know, what would you say I, um, some standard fees are? Yeah, so uh, we used to call it like a due diligence or origin, uh, you know, uh, origination organization fee. Um, nowadays, uh, so there used to be that and an acquisition fee. I think nowadays people are like kind of doing away with the former and just bundling it all as an acquisition fee, um, you know, and then there's a host of other fees that the sponsor can charge depending on what they're doing. So for example, if it's new construction, they might, and, and it's vertically integrated, let's say they're, they're managing the construction in-house. Well, then they might charge a um, uh, a construction management or development fee, right? Um, but some other fees I've seen in my lifetime are refinance fee, disposition fee. Um, sometimes the uh, sponsor or a member of the sponsor uh, does have a real estate license, and so when they're actually buying or selling the asset, they may take a commission which, you know, someone would usually be taking anyway. It's just, they have to disclose that they're taking it. Um, some deals uh, have vertically integrated property management. Um, and so to the extent there's that, um, you know, there, there's for value add, there's almost always going to be a property management fee, but, um, you know, for ones that are vertically integrated, they will usually charge at market or even slightly less. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that overview. Um, yeah, I would say, is there is there anything else that, I mean, obviously investors should read the entire document and understand it. What advice would you give to someone who's, you know, doing this for the first time, let's say, and they're maybe feeling a little overwhelmed with the documents? Um, well, I will say that I know the documents look overwhelming, but once you read through different ones a couple of times, they, they honestly all start sounding the same. And so you, you, you can get a grasp pretty quickly of what you should look out for. Um, you know, uh, if you're in the same asset class, the risk factors will oftentimes be very, very similar. Um, it's more so the deal terms, um, you know, the loan terms and, and the nuances of the deal itself that actually change, you know, whether or not they're planning to refi or hold or, you know, whether there's a, a buyout provision or things of that sort. Um, the other thing I would just say is, and I'm not sure that that many investors look at this, but I think it is important, is, you know, um, first of all, the percentage interest that investors own um, versus the sponsor. So usually it's called class A, class B. Um, that does not necessarily have to correlate with, um, you know, sorry. So let me put this in a different way. 
the legal ownership interest in the company does not necessarily have to correlate with the economic or distribution interest of the company. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're looking at a deal that has a 70-30 split, 72 class A investors, and then 30% uh, to class B sponsors. Just because that deal is a 70-30 economic split does not mean that it's 70-30 percentage ownership in the company, right? A lot of syndications will have it as 70% um, class A ownership, 30% class B ownership. But I've seen, you know, things all across the board um, from, you know, 99% owned by class A investors all the way to, you know, a very minimal amount. And it's not to say one is better than the other, but they should just know that to the extent um to the extent that trouble happens in the future, maybe the sponsor disappears or um, the deal is underwater and the sponsor is not being communicative or maybe the sponsor is just not doing a good job. That's when these things um, really start coming into play and really um, become very important because you know, there are governance provisions around voting rights for investors and whether or not they have a vote, um, how much their vote counts, and what percentage of a vote you need to um, do certain things, right? Make certain decisions or even replace the manager or the sponsor if, if that's what needs to happen. And so, you know, um, you know people should be looking at, uh, at least take a glance at the governance provisions to fully understand what their rights are when things go south. For sure, yeah, that makes, a lot of sense. So just to clarify one thing that you you mentioned. So were you saying, did I understand correctly that the um the 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 distribution, like say 70, it was going to be a 70-30 waterfall split to investors and sponsors, is that a different split than the ownership split? And what are the implications if they are different? Right. So they it, it it's the sponsor's choice, really it can be different. It doesn't have to be, right? And so a lot of sponsors, they're just like, oh, I'm just going to make it the same. 70-30 ownership, 70-30 economic interest, right? Um, but there are cases where that's not the case. Um, and really the implications for the uh, investor um, are what are their control and voting rights? Because when everything's going well, right? Uh, no one thinks about those things, but it's when things are not going well that suddenly you start reading that part of the operating agreement and you're like, oh, wait, like it's going to take this much to like, you know, take, you know, control the deal or take over the deal or, you know, kick the manager out or, or, or um, something, right? Um, and so that's when people start reading, reading those governance provisions. Okay, interesting. So you're saying sometimes they'll do an economic split of 70-30, but then maybe the ownership will be 99% um, sponsor? Or maybe or... even 50-50, right? It just okay. it depends on the sponsor. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes people end up doing this um, for like loan financing reasons, right? Um, so for example, when banks are underwriting you, they will typically ask, is there any... Um, they will typically ask who will have 20% or more ownership interest in the company, the, the LLC. Um, and usually that's the sponsor group, but maybe if you have one really large investor that takes half the deal, suddenly they cross that 20% threshold and you have to end up reporting this to, the, um, to your lender um, because different lenders handle this differently, right? So sometimes it's that and sometimes it's more so just about control. Okay, got it. Well, Amy, that was a wealth of information. I know that there's, we're just kind of scratching the surface with legal documents and what it is that investors should kind of be be looking at was they're getting into syndications, but I think you gave us a wonderful starting point. And um, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll have to have you on again sometime in the future to continue the conversation. I'd love to take the last minute or so to shine the spotlight on you and tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you and anything else you'd like to share. 
Sure. Um, it's pretty easy to get a hold of us. Uh, you, they can just go to bootstraplegal.com. And if they want to talk to us, just press a button and find a time on my calendar for a quick consultation. Um, other than that, you know, we're, we're generally around and, and very available and, uh, you know, always happy to talk to people. Yeah, I will definitely, I have definitely taken advantage of the quick consultation. It's really easy to schedule and Amy's super generous with her knowledge. And if you have any questions about the legal aspects of getting into syndications, um, she's a great resource. So thank you so much, Amy. Can't have a great day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me.